In this video, we will do an epsilon delta proof for the limit of a quadratic function. So the example says that we want to look at the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x squared plus 2x plus 3. Part A asks, what is this limit? So this wants us to figure out what this limit is supposed to be. So we can do it using our algebraic methods by just plugging in first. So if we plug in, we will get negative 3 squared plus 2 times negative 3 plus 3. So this is 9 minus 6 plus 3, which is 6. So that's what the limit should be. And then part B says, now prove it using epsilon delta. So I mentioned before that these epsilon delta proofs for nonlinear functions are going to be more challenging. So I want you to be ready for that. As we go through this proof, if there are times when you need to pause the video, slow down, or rewatch parts, that is absolutely natural. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so we want to begin with some scratch work. And remember, the purpose of the scratch work is to guess a value for delta. We're going to work backwards and try to guess a value for delta. So we are going to let epsilon be greater than zero. And my goal in the scratch work is we want to find a number delta that is greater than zero such that such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus whatever my a value is, which is negative three here. So remember this is mirroring absolute value of x minus a in the general definition. That needs to be less than delta. So if that's the case, then the absolute value of f of x minus l so let me write the general one first, absolute value of f of x minus l. So my f of x, my function here is x squared plus 2x plus 3. Then we got to do minus our l, our limit, which is 6. I want that to be less than epsilon. Okay, so, so first off, this double negative is going to become a positive. So I'll get x plus 3 here. And remember that with the scratch work, we begin with the epsilon inequality, x squared plus 2, sorry, uh, I wrote minus, but that should be a plus, plus 2x, plus 2x plus 3, and then minus 6 is less than epsilon. I start with this, and our goal is to make this look like the delta inequality. We want to make this look like absolute value of x plus 3 is less than delta and then be able to match them up so I can figure out what to let delta be. Okay, so if I simplify this, we get x squared plus 2x minus 3 is less than epsilon. And now this factors as x plus 3 times x minus 1 is less than epsilon. And when I have the absolute value of something times something, that's going to be the absolute value of the first thing. x plus 3 times the absolute value of the second thing, x minus 1. And then I have that is less than epsilon. So if I want to get the absolute value of x plus 3 by itself, I would divide by this other absolute value. And if I do that, I get absolute value of x plus 3 is less than epsilon over the absolute value of x minus 1. It just turns out that there's a, a key problem with this. Because based off of what we've done before, we'd really like for this thing to be our delta. But delta is supposed to just be a number. It can't have a variable like x in it. So delta can't have an x in it. It's fine for there to be an epsilon in delta, because epsilon is just some number that we're fixing. Like maybe epsilon is 1. And if it was, then the numerator would just be 1. But I can't have an x in what delta is, because x could be a range of values. Now it's bad. So going back to our inequality here involving epsilon, I want to have the absolute value of x plus 3 there because I need that to make it look like this delta inequality. But for the absolute value of x minus 1, it would be really nice if this was just a number because then I could divide by it and then my delta wouldn't have any variable like x in it. Okay, so I'm going to use that as our motivating idea. So my idea is we are going to try to find a number. 
I'm going to call it m, such that the absolute value of x minus 1 is going to be less than m. I want to sort of know what's the biggest the absolute value of x minus 1 can be. And then once I know what the biggest the absolute value of x minus 1 can be, I am going to then try to guarantee that this whole left hand side will be less than epsilon. And we'll be able to do that because the absolute value of x plus 3, that's going to be less than delta. And we get to pick delta, so we'll try to pick delta to be small enough so that the whole left hand, left hand side is going to be less than epsilon. Okay, going back to our idea, we're trying to find a number m such that absolute value of x minus 1 will be less than m. Because then, if I look at the absolute value of x plus 3 times x minus 1, this will be less than, keep absolute value of x plus 3 as it is, but absolute value of x minus 1 will be less than m. And then we want this to be less than epsilon. And we want that epsilon there so that we can say that the absolute value of x plus 3 times x minus 1 will be less than the epsilon, like we needed up above here. All right, so now to do this, we need another key idea. So the other idea is that in this problem, x is getting close to negative 3. We get to pick this distance delta that we're allowed to go away from negative 3. So let's just pick something tentatively for delta that keeps us pretty close to negative 3. Let's just let delta be equal to 1 for the time being. And now let's draw a picture of some axes. I'm going to draw some axes. And on these axes, I want to get a feel for well, how big is the absolute value of x minus 1 going to be if delta is allowed to be 1? So what I'm going to first draw is y equals x minus 1 without the absolute value. So this is a line. The y-intercept is negative 1. And the slope is 1. So that line is going to look like, it's going to look like this. And then it's going to cross the x-axis at 1 and continue upwards like this. All righty. When I put the absolute value on this function, what that's going to do is it makes any part of the graph that has a negative y value become positive. So the negative part, all of this is going to go away and it'll flip up to become positive. And now this looks like an absolute value graph like we're used to. Another way that I could see that is this should be like the graph of absolute value of x, which is the typical v shape, but with a vertex at the origin. But the minus one just shifts it one unit to the right, which is what we have. All righty. Our limit was as x approaches negative 3, so I'm going to label negative 3 here. And if I plug in negative 3 into this function's graph, the y value I'll get is 4. And right now I'm picking delta to be 1, which means I can go one unit to the left of negative 3, which puts me at negative 4. I can go one unit to the right, which puts me at negative 2. And if I draw up to the graph, let's put an open circle here because my delta equals 1, but my distance uh, is up to less than delta. Remember, the distance that I can go away from negative 3 is less than delta. That's why I put an open circle there at that endpoint. So now I'm going to draw a line up he here from this edge, an open circle there as well. And now let's label these y values. It's kind of like I'm creating my epsilon window here. Okay, if I plug in negative 2 into this equation, absolute value of x minus 1, I'll get 3. And if I plug in negative 4 for x, I get 5 for the y value. So if delta is 1, then the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 5. That's the biggest the y value ever gets. Okay, but what if I made the delta smaller than 1? What if delta was less than or equal to 1? then I would be going some smaller distance away from negative 3. Let's just do a smaller distance to the left, smaller distance to the right. And then if I draw up, I put an open circle here, put an open circle here. Even there, my y values are still, I can still say for sure that they're less than 5. So even here, we still have, we still have that absolute value of x minus 1 is going to be less than 5. All right, so if we take this 
and tie it back to our first idea, what we were trying to do there, what we now can say is that the absolute value of x plus 3 times the absolute value of x minus 1, that is going to be less than the absolute value of x plus 3 times 5, because the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 5. That's what we just showed in this picture. And then we want this to be less than epsilon. And just kind of going back to this idea of this delta, and when we said delta is 1 kind of initially, and then we said delta is less than or equal to 1, this is okay to do, because overall, when we do these epsilon delta problems, our goal is, once the epsilon is given, we get to pick the delta. We get to pick this distance delta that we go away from a, in this case, negative 3. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're making sort of a tentative pick and saying, okay, if I let delta be 1 and then let delta be less than or equal to 1, this is what ends up happening. Okay. All right. So now if I continue with this and I isolate my absolute value of x plus 3, it is less than epsilon over 5. And that is, if I think back to my original goal, I was hoping to get something like this, absolute value of x plus 3 by itself. And then we usually, at this point, let delta be what we have on the other side. But if I just let delta be this, epsilon over 5, that ignores the fact that we needed to also assume that delta was less than or equal to 1 to be able to say that the absolute value of x minus 1 was less than 5. And I really needed that inequality to be able to set up this chain that ultimately gave me something that was less than epsilon. Okay, so what I need now is, is two things. One is, I need to still be able to say that delta is less than or equal to 1. Without that, this chain of inequalities, I wouldn't have been able to set it up. But then, I'm also going to need to take this thing into account. That's kind of saying delta should be epsilon over 5. Let's just be a little bit safe, and let's just say delta is less than or equal to epsilon over 5. Make it even smaller. So there's a trick that I can do to guarantee that both of these happen. And the trick is to let delta be equal to the minimum of the two. So min of 1 and epsilon over 5. So when I write this notation, it means, well, whichever is smaller, either 1 or epsilon over 5, depending on what the epsilon happens to be, that's what we're going to let delta be. This will guarantee that delta is less than or equal to 1, and it's less than or equal to epsilon over 5. All right, now let's take on the proof. Let's see how this is going to all work out in the proof. So we started off by writing given epsilon greater than 0. We are going to pick our delta to be the minimum of 1 and epsilon over 5. OK. Then if 0 is less than absolute value of x minus a, which in this case is going to give me plus 3 because I've got a double negative, is less than delta, then I want to consider I want to consider the absolute value of my function, x squared plus 2x plus 3, and then minus what the limit should be, which was 6. So I want to consider that. And I'm really hoping that this will, after I simplify it, be less than epsilon. OK, so I can simplify it to get x squared plus 2x minus 3. I can factor to get x plus 3 times x minus 1. And now I can split this up as the absolute value of x plus 3 times the absolute value of x minus 1. So this is where, in our scratch work, we ultimately were able to get that the absolute value of x minus 1 was uh, less than 5 after we did that delta is less than or equal to 1 thing. So why, does that, why do we get to say that in the proof? Well, it comes from the fact that we pick this for delta. Delta is the minimum of these two things. So because it's the minimum of these two things, for sure, delta is going to be less than or equal to both of them. So let's use the fact that it's less than or equal to 1. And because it's less than or equal to 1, and the absolute value of x plus 3 is less than delta, that means absolute value of x plus 3 is going to be less than 1. So I need to now algebraically break this inequality down so I can say something about the absolute value of x minus 1 and, and what's that, what that will be less than. Okay, 
So here's how I'm going to do that. I have the absolute value of some stuff, x plus 3, is less than 1. The only way that can happen is if that stuff is in between negative 1 and positive 1. Now I'm going to do the same thing to each part of this chain of inequality so that the x plus 3 becomes x minus 1. So let's, I just got to subtract 4 from everything. If I subtract 4 from everything, we get x minus 1 in the middle. And then over here, we get negative 3. Over here, we get negative 5. Okay, so x minus 1 is in between negative 5 and negative 3. Now I have to absolute value it. So if x minus 1 is something in between negative 5 and negative 3, when I absolute value it, that should be in between positive 3 and positive 5. But I got to put positive 3 on this side because I got to put the smaller number here. 3 is less than absolute value of x minus 5. Okay, so I'm going to use that next. So we get to now say that this is less than absolute value of x plus 3, and the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 5. So we are using this fact at this step. All right, and now absolute value of x plus 3, we get to use the fact that that is less than delta. So this is going to be less than delta times 5. Okay, now I'm going to use the other piece of information I know about delta, because the minimum of these two numbers, that means delta is also going to be less than or equal to epsilon over 5. So I get to say that this is going to be less than or equal to, replace the delta with epsilon over 5, times the 5, now those 5's cancel, and I get epsilon, just like I wanted. So thus, the absolute value of x squared, oops, x squared plus 2x plus 3 minus 6 is in fact less than epsilon like we wanted. Therefore, put a period here, therefore our limit, the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x squared plus 2x plus 3, it does equal 6 like I wanted it to. And I'll put my square and shade it in to indicate I'm done with the proof. So in terms of our goals for this section, we've now finished our last goal, which was to do an epsilon delta proof for a quadratic function limit. And as I mentioned before, this was gonna be a more challenging video. Just the nature of the example, how I do that delta is the minimum of two things. So definitely go through this at your own pace. If you need to pause, rewatch the video, and even then if you have questions, definitely take advantage of office hours and SLC tutoring to ask about them.